Quick Goal, the official goal of soccer, presents Quick Chat, a quick-hitting interview series with some of the top people from around the soccer world. We discover how coaches got to their position and advice they give to a younger self. Welcome to Quick Chat. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we have Coach Weiss at Georgetown University. Coach, how are we doing? We're doing well. Very, very good. The last time I was in that office... The walls were blank. There was hardly a desk. There was some scattered furniture. So I like what you've done with the place. It looks good. Yeah, it's it's uh, we, we've had some time to, to do some decorating. We got our, our behind me. We, we have our recruiting wall, uh, which is really which is really just um, any of our any of our players who've gotten drafted, who've come through our program. Right. Um, we get uh, we, they, they go up on the wall and uh, but they only go up on the wall if they get their degree as well at the same time so oh, um nice. you know we have a couple guys are still waiting we have their jerseys ready and we have their their little nameplate ready but they're still there's still a couple classes away so they'll uh they'll, they'll make their way up there when, when they when they finish but it's um you know for for us it our niche is is um guys who really want to be pros but guys who really want this degree at the same time so if guys leave too early it's, it's not they're not going to get the degree so we we uh, we like showing, um, you know, young, you know, 16, 17 year old aspiring professional players. Uh, they have a good head on their shoulders that they, that the pathway is not one or the other, right? You can be, can become a pro uh, while still getting a, a, a top level degree at the same time. And, and um, uh, you know, we, we, we got a whole wall full of people who've done it and, and continuing to do it. So uh, it's, it's nice for the recruits to see it's an option. Yeah. Well, it looks good. The last time I saw you, you were knocking off my alma mater in Cary, winning a national championship. Um, so I know I've congratulated you on that already. But the question I have for you is, are you considered a two-time national champion, back-to-back -back champion in this COVID year? Has NCAA told you anything? What? How does that work? No, sadly, Marshall Marshall does get the claim to it. So what, oh, okay, um, okay. Uh, uh, it was just it was just an extended championship, right? We didn't get re we didn't get the repeat, uh, unfortunately. But the you know the um, the the NCAA um, very fortunately from our point of view um, didn't punt on you know the the 2020 season. So even though the 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 championship season in effect happened in the spring of 2021. It's really right. the, the 2020 year gotcha. um, that, that, that finally got played in. And, and we were super fortunate to have had that competition and play it and, and right. hold off as well as it did. So we just were, we, we were just national champions. This maybe the longest running national champions. That's that we, right. we hey, take it, take it. All looks good. I ran into you in San Diego in 1996 when the mls was kicking off i was there at the first mls combine and i stopped and visited a friend of mine and we ran into each other you know in that one night out or whatever it was so that was 1996. um i know your bio pretty well but just kind of talk us through your pathway we had uh, we had coach riley on at notre dame the other day and we we were talking a lot about um, his pathway and, and how your uh, your road kind of intersects with that that legendary coach. So, talk to us about how you ended up where you are. Take us back as far as you want, but go. <laughs> well, I'll go. I'll go back to '96 at least for where where you know our. If you remember, obviously our meeting in in San Diego at that time, I wasn't a coach. I was a, right, I was yeah. a, a fledgling yeah. engineer, right? I was trying not to sink a startup company. Um, as an engineer right out of college yeah. um, but uh, but you and I you and I were able to, to recollect on our playing days when you you beat the stuffing out of us in the NCAA tournament uh, back in what was it 92 probably yeah. one of the best college teams that that's come through um, just in the history of college soccer was your 92 Virginia team that era of Virginia teams was a pretty special group yeah, yeah um, we, we, tried our best. We, we tried our best, but it was not, uh, we were not, we, we fell prey to that juggernaut just like everyone else. So my plan wasn't to leave college and to get right into coaching. I was just, I was going to be, I was going to be an engineer. That was sort of my vocation of sorts. I had an interest in doing design, like product design. Actually, if I had my way, um, I, I wouldn't be coaching at all. I'd probably be like with Nike or Adidas or something like trying to design sure. like the next great shoe or something right like that was kind of where i was sort of interested in i just i always wanted to be around sport but 
Um, but you know, I'd always been around coaching, always liked to coach. So like my, my senior year in college, um, I went to, to, to college at Dartmouth up in Hanover, New Hampshire. And there was a, a club that the, the, the soccer program had put in place and they needed coaches. And so they asked the, the senior class, was anybody interested in, in, in actually coaching a team their senior spring? And I, I said, yeah, that sounded fun. And I did it. I coached a U15 boys team and had, had a really good time uh, with learning how to do that, right? Like picking a team and running sessions. And I, I had no idea what I was doing at that time, but it was, yeah. it was something that was, um, that I just was, I didn't even think twice about it. It's like, that'd be, even though it, it was, it made it hard for me to do my schoolwork. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to travel, you had to go to practices all the time. You had to be really disciplined with that. Um, right. And right. then in San Diego, when I met you, I was working as an engineer. I, I fell into coaching a, a, another club team as a girls U17 team um, in San Diego. And I think they were just practicing out behind, literally practicing in the, in the park behind my, con my uh, apartment complex. And I was doing right. one of my rare runs at that time. I did a rare run and I ended up at the, at the, the, the park and <clears throat> fell into conversation with the, 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 the team manager. And then like two weeks later, I'm coaching the team. It was just something that was always sort of fun for me to do. I always like liked filling my time doing it, yeah. but it was never a career per se it's funny how fate kind of intervenes. I was always hoping to go to a, there was a, a master's program at Stanford. I really wanted to do a design program at Stanford. There's a very specific okay. program I got interested in when I was an undergrad at, at, at uh, in college. My mentor, uh, Bobby Clark, who you referenced, I think there is, is a, he's a Scotsman, yep. uh, um, one of the great, you know, soccer uh, ambassadors that's I think ever, ever been in the U S <clears throat> he coached me uh, when I was a player. And so I knew him very well. He knew me well. And he, just by complete happenstance, he took over the men's program at Stanford in 1996, yeah. the exact yeah. same time I was coming in to do a master's degree. And so he, he said, uh, yeah, you know, he's, he needed people he knew he trusted to come in and right. help. And I said, I would love to do that. And uh, I just started being fundamentally a volunteer assistant, right? I, I had my program I was doing this, but every time, you know, whenever the team was practicing or training, I was there, I, I, would, I would travel with the team, I would do all the stuff that they were doing. And I just didn't do any of the office work for that first really year year or so. Yeah, yeah. But because Stanford at that time only had one paid assistant, I was really the second assistant, which allowed me to recruit. So I was able to go out in the summers and, and do, I was very much a, a, a on-field coach. And then when my master's program ended, if I was a better engineer, if I was a better designer, I would have been hired by somebody, but nobody <laughs> wanted to hire me. So, so um, you know, Bobby, Bobby, uh, at, it was literally, you know, just say, Hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to be a coach? Do you want to go into design? And I was like, you know, I thought about it for, um, you know, all of two seconds. And I'm like, you know, I really enjoy coaching. You know, that's where I, I, that's where I really always wanted to gravitate to. That's where I spent my time thinking about doing it. And, um, just, just by blind luck, you know, because of that, that interaction, right. um, and the timing of him being at the same place I was, I, I, I just fell into it. Um, and just, you know, that's, that's where, I really became a full-time coach this is back in 1998. Spent another three years with him at Stanford. Okay. Uh, he moved to Notre Dame in 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, and it made sense for me and, and my family at that time uh, to go with him to South Bend. So we, we left in 2001 to, to Notre Dame. Uh, was there for five years. And then um, got the head coaching job at Georgetown in 2006. So, so right. you know, that's right. been now, it's, it's going into my 16th season now at Georgetown. But it's really interesting when you talk to young coaches and they're trying to get advice and counsel. And, and there's a lot of different pathways to doing it. Mine was just incredibly lucky. Yeah, you know, it really was. I mean, for what I wanted to do, there's a lot of people who work really hard to try to get into yeah, for sure. um, that, that first opportunity to get into a program as a, as a coach, as a volunteer coach, or as a second assistant. And for me, it just, it was just the um, unbelievable timing and luck that sort of led to it, you know, networking and, 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 and knowing people and working camps and getting, because at the end of the day, the reason why I came in as a coach for Bobby was because he knew me and trusted me. He knew exactly what he was going to get me as a coach. Yeah, yeah. And and our, you know, the 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 staffs are so small. You know, we have two full time assistants, a volunteer assistant. There's really four coaches that are really in your core group. Of, you really need to know who those people are and what they're going to give you. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that they're quality and they they're going to see things in the same way and. Um, so I just got very lucky that that someone who knew me and trusted me was was you know was was sort of in the same place same time as I was. Yeah, not a, not a bad place to get your start and not bad company to keep, right? So uh, a, a an unusual story, but you know you've made the most of it. So good for you. Coaching education. So 
you, you didn't have this idea of moving into coaching after you were done playing. How, how did you go about it? Like, did, did Coach Clark say, hey, look, I want you to pursue your licensing and this is what I want you to do? Is it something you did on your own? Uh, how, how did that play out? Yeah. He, um, yeah, he 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 felt it was good to do for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, and I was able to, you know, back then it was the NSCAA was the organization that that ran uh, one real vein of, of coaching education. And then there's U.S. Soccer has their 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 vein of coaching uh, yeah. education. And they're very parallel um, in terms of how they're sort of thought about and put together. And um, and I was because of my playing, I wasn't. Um, really defaulted into something as a, as a professional, you know, I, I really had so many years as a college player and they sort of said, uh, you know, you can start in, uh, with the, I think it was the national d- diploma, right? There's the, it was okay. the national, the advanced national, the premier, or you can go to the, 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 the ABC kind of sequence on this side. Sure. And I think it, when you looked at it, it was like, well, how high up can I start? Um, and they, they, you know, they said, well, you can sort of do the equivalent of the C license, right? Okay. For the, that. And, and that was called the national diploma. And, you know, it, it, I was in a situation where, you know, Stanford wasn't paying a lot of money uh, uh, for me to do it, but he, he was able to sort of give me the the funding to fly out to Florida at that time in Florida, went out and uh, and pay for the, you know, the the tuition for, for doing that. The, the university that, you know, the, the, the Stanford paid for that at that time. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think that he thought that was a good thing to do just as a young coach it, for networking, to meet people. Um, so, and then just to get some ideas on how to do it. it and it, it was really fun back then. I mean, I, and I kind of hammered through it. So I did the, 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 the national diploma, which, which sort of was the equivalent of the C they recognized each other at that time, which let me then do the B, but I also mm-hmm. wanted to do the advanced national. So I did the B and the advanced national. And then, uh, that let me do the A and the premier is what they call them. So I did both yeah. of those I actually did, I think must've been five different courses. Um, and, and they're very similar in how layout, but there's very different tenor into how they were put together. Yeah. Um, the NSCAA one at that time, the United Soccer Coaches Group. Now, the NSCAA at that time was was a, I found it to be a little more collaborative, right? There was a little bit more of like yeah. let's kind of work through this together and let's support you how to do this. And then, and then yeah. the U.S. Soccer was a little bit more of a, of a of a pressure cooker, right? There's a lot of you know there's a little bit people felt the pressure to perform, to think, and to think on their feet and to do things. And there's actually some real value in both of those uh, both of those pathways to me. But it, it was. It was something that once you started, you wanted to continue. Yeah. Um, I think they've evolved them. I think they're a lot more involved now and, and maybe a little more thorough. And I think they're probably put together in a, in a, in a better way. But, you know, I, I thought it was great. Uh, they're incredibly hard because you have to play. You're, you're, you're the, the players for all the other coaches' demos. So you're like, your body's shattered by the end of it because none of us are in good enough shape to do that. But um, but listen, I mean, you get, you get um, all sorts of ideas, right? Everyone's kind of coming with some little ideas that they like to use to be comfortable with, to run their sessions and handle their ideas. And, uh, but how you structure a session, how you think about uh, organizing um, a a practice plan, uh, how you analyze a game, how you, how do you um, uh, uh, put in coaching points? All those things were really good, but I I, I actually, I, you know, I really enjoyed watching other people's little, you know, sessions they were putting on. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, um, and then meeting a, a great group of, of coaches who are, who sort of, of grow with you, right? Everyone's sort of, you know, these people that you did these coaching courses with, with at one point are now, you know, you know coaches at, at some of these other programs. It was, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's the biggest uh, nugget for me out of those coaching courses, just who you network with, who you meet. And a lot of those guys I'm still talking to today. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, it's great fun. Along the way, in all your stops, best moment. Is there a best moment? One that does does anything beat winning the national championship? Is is that number one? You you know it's it's funny you say that Eric because there's a lot of them at the end of the day and and um, I've I mean that, listen I mean yeah that, I mean that was pretty fun right you win the whole thing that's that's yeah. you've done it as a player right it's, there's something to it that's just um, pretty pretty cementing uh, for that group that's gone through it. Um, what it meant to the alumni base, what it meant to the, the university itself, sure. our players, uh, families, uh, you know, it, it, it's pretty special. You can't replicate that, right? You mm-hmm. really can't. Uh, uh, but as an assistant with Bobby, we took over um, a Stanford program that hadn't really had a lot of success, right? They, I think they were five and 12 on successive seasons before they came in. Mm-hmm. And Bobby was, was just, he was a magician in, in, in sort of getting a culture put into place really quickly and becoming successful really quickly. I mean, that, that Stanford team, 
um, went to a national final just in within um, uh, three seasons. I mean, mm -hmm. unbelievably fast uh, yeah. success. Yeah. And then uh, same thing in Notre Dame, the Notre Dame team he inherited, I think when we went over to South Bend was they, they had had a, a losing season. There was just, they, they, they were struggling a bit. And I think within a year they're in the NCAA tournament. So Bobby was able to sort of turn around. And, and, and when I came to Notre, to, to, from Notre Dame to Georgetown, uh, I remember thinking, well, this is going to be no problem. And it was just not, I don't know how he does it so well, but I, it took me a lot longer. So you're moving into your head coaching position and you're taking over your program and you've spent all these years with Bobby. Could you ever put your finger on what he did, what, what his magic was? And are you able to replicate that in some way, shape or form with, you know, with your groups now? Uh, I mean, he he was he was exceptionally good at getting buy in right away. You know, he's exceptionally good at getting people just to, to, to line up and say, we're going to we're going to go all start pushing together. And he was just a great teacher. Right. So he taught efficiently. He got people to understand things really quickly. So so everyone really quickly bought into what he was doing, understood exactly what they were supposed to do, how they're supposed to do it. Uh, and, and just, just worked incredibly hard for each other. Right. So that alone, you know, and then you add talent in there and you're going to be a good team very quickly. So yeah. for me, it just, it just, you know, I, 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 we're just different coaches, right. I'm not, I, I was a 32 year old first time head coach at Georgetown trying to do sort of the formula that I knew from my time as a player for him. And then, yeah. and then two different programs everything's nuanced differently, right? The guys are different. The, 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 the situation is different. You're maybe coming into a league that's maybe a little harder or, you know, I, I think uh, we came into a Stanford team that was really talented and really frustrated with not winning. And so they were, they were ready to, to do what it took. Yeah. Uh, Notre Dame was kind of the same. They were really talented. And, and, and I think it just took me a little bit longer to kind of get the same kind of ethos at Georgetown to be, to be frank, it just took longer. Uh, yeah. and, and not that we weren't trying, uh, I mean, we were trying un unbelievably hard, but it's, um, you know, how you handle people, you learn about a lot as a coach, right? How you handle the, the starter who's needs to be sort of massaged very differently from the guy who's just doesn't play a second, uh, yeah. and, and how you get them sort of to be, to be bought in. Are you, are you, are you managing those guys? Well, Bobby was just exceptionally good at that. Yeah. Very honest. And, and uh, I think that was a, the, the, a lot of the keys to it. He's incredibly honest about how he was doing things, but very thoughtful, a lot of empathy for, for the people he was handling and, and uh, knew when to be hard on guys and knew when he had to sort of, you know, be more gentle and help them through it. And, yeah. um, you know, but it, I mean, I think in answer to your initial question, um, some of the great coaching sort of memories I have is really independent on all of those teams where you've, you've taken a group of guys that, maybe never think they're going to get to a spot, right? They, okay. they, they okay. five and 12. We've been told you'll never win at Stanford. It's too hard. Admissions is too difficult. They play in a league that's too, you'll never recruit against UCLA. You'll never be able to beat Santa Clara in those days. Those are, these are these powers. They're yeah. in your backyard. You're always going to be second fiddle. Um, and then getting, getting those, those teams to the level where they never thought they could get to. Those are really the fun times, right? So I think for, sure. um, you know, I, I left Notre Dame before Bobby won the national championship there in 2013. Um, but, you know, you the building of that was was really exceptional. And then, you know, for me, um, the same thing at Georgetown. We got to the, the, the national final in 2012 with with a, in a, with a group of guys that I think sort of thought they could, but they had never done it before. Um, and, I you know, I think one of my 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 favorite coaching moments that I've ever had was actually the, the first quarter final we got to in 2012 that got us to the final four, the college cup. Uh, we played San Diego, University of San Diego at home. Um, and, you know, there was standing room only kind of crowds. Like, I mean, the place was completely yeah, um, yeah. over full. And, mm -hmm. and when that team won that game, there's late goals. So it was like, it was always in the balance. We're losing in the second half, we equalized on an own goal. We scored to go up and maybe 20 minutes left. And then we, we iced the game with maybe three or four minutes left to get go up three to one. Um, and that kind of moment sort of, sort of gives me chills as a coach because you can feel the entire community yeah. having a first time experience, right? Those kinds of things, you know, I think are, are, have been special at every one of the places we've been. When I think about 2019 and I think about your position as a coach, 
did you go into that season, that national championship season, thinking we've got a real shot at this? Or was it something that never really crossed your mind until the midway point or the latter part of the season where you made a run? Um, what was the feeling in preseason versus postseason? I mean, I try to be objective, like when you think back in history about like, well, what, you know, what was it? What were you really thinking about the, the prospects of a team? I think our we've had a program where I think we've had a lot of teams that that I, I felt could maybe win the whole thing. Right. 2015 was one of the most talented starting 11s I've ever been around um, and we lost in the Sweet 16. Uh, we lost to Virginia and penalty kicks in 2014 and the team that could have easily won it in the mm -hmm. quarterfinals. Um, you know, you, you kind of go 2013 had a really good year. We had, we had teams that were sort of in and around it. And so I think when you're a coach at, 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 at in our, in our, um, arena, you know, you're always a little prepared for the fact that you might have a, uh, to be fair, I think you're very prepared for the fact that you might have a, you know, a 40 year coaching career and never win a national championship. That's the reality of it. And so. Uh, I think you always go into a year, even when you think you have a good group of players, we have an older group of players. We had, I think we, I think I started sort of thinking the team was different when we were really putting together preseason and thinking, all right, how are we going to set training? Who's going to play against who? And you're like, boy, we, we, we have, we have a lot of guys. Like who's going to start in this team, right? Like if I start this group, the yeah. word about this, this guy's like, what if I start this group? I have the, you know, and, and that was the first time where I had legitimate trouble trying to figure out like, well, we don't have like an easy 11, 12, 13. It was like, we had like 15, 16 guys that was then supplemented when you, which you find out about pretty quickly in preseason and early games with like a group of freshmen that were, that just came right into it and were very, yeah. very capable of helping and helped significantly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we had a different level of depth than I think we've ever had. And I think, you know, uh, when you run through a college season, you're always on the verge of calamity, right? There's always like, there's an injury. There's, you know, you have a, 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 a zero, zero tie. That's the beginning of the end, you know, as a coach, or you're never going to score a goal again, or you, you have the loss. You know, we lost to Louisville. That was the only loss we had was at Louisville. And he's like, well, that may, you know, what's going to happen to the psyche of the team. And so you're, you're never feeling great until, you know, at the end of the whole thing. But I, what I did feel we had was an exceptional amount of depth, um, which was, which was different than anything we've had before. Perfect. So you've had a bunch of those teams that you felt really good about, didn't quite make it as far uh, as you might have hoped in the beginning. Is there a worst, I, I hate to phrase it, worst coaching moment, but is there one that's just kind of a low light? Every one of our losses that ends a season, like, is devastating, right? Every team that, you know, you get to the tournament, yeah. you lose on penalties, uh, you lose one nothing in a Sweet 16 game, uh, you know, we lose an own goal. All each one of those is, is incredibly devastating um, and low lights in that way and that the journey ends. Yeah. Right. And, and you're always sort of questioning, you know, could you have pushed through there? I think I think to be honest, um, probably probably my biggest regret as a coach was in 2012. We had a team that uh, went to the final. We played a really hard game in the semifinal and, and we played a final. And I think at that time, you know, in essence, you made a decision to sort of play your horses, so to speak, right? Like we're going to play the national championship. We got to go with the guys that we really trust um, right. who are going to, who are your match winners. You can do that stuff. Um, and I think one of my big, my big regrets and maybe a low light really, you know, when I, when I think back on, on a lot of the things that we've gone through is, um, you know, we didn't play a couple guys in the final that, that we had played along the way, you know, and not that they weren't good enough, but they weren't really your horses. Um, and I have a lot of, I have a lot of regret for some of those guys who, who I should have trusted, right. In that setting. And, and, yeah. and, you know, I didn't give them the opportunity to play in a national final or maybe play just, you know, spare, spare minutes in this, in the final. Uh, I really wish I had trusted them as much as they maybe deserve to be trusted and, and to be fair, maybe would have helped us win because, you know, the guys, the guys, the horses that we were trying to use just didn't have, have the juice to do it on their own. They needed the help. Yeah. Um, in that game. And that, that would be one of the things if I had a real low light or uh, sort of speak, or maybe a regret is I really wish I had trusted that the, the team that we had, that roster that we had, yeah. um, uh, that we built up along the way and just said, it's either good enough or it's not right. Your, your, your collective is either good enough or it's not. And, and, and when guys, when you do, and, and that was the 2019 team, I took that lesson very much into 2019. Okay. Uh, and I said, listen, if we give guys the chance and they're doing the job, 
keep giving them the chance, even if they're not as good as this All American and this All American. Keep giving, keep keep trusting those guys. Keep giving them the opportunity. Um, and 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 you know, we did that to to great success in 2019. Well, the potential problem escalates the better your program is and the more attractive your program becomes because you have those numbers and the depth that you talk about and the number of guys that can step on the field and do a job for you. So it, it becomes more and more difficult, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, it does. And, and that's where you need guys to understand who, you know, the value of everyone and, and, and to get them to, to, to buy into the team concept. It works itself out in, in a pretty remarkable way. If, if you get guys that really do respect each other, Right. Um, and listen, you, 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 at the end of the day, you can't play guys who don't, don't reciprocate, right? If I give, if I give someone an opportunity and they don't really do the job, yeah. they're not handling details well, well, then they don't play. Right. But, the, but the guys who do do it and, and, and are, are handling all the business, right. And maybe they're, again, maybe they're not quite good enough, but they're doing, those guys won't let you down at the end of the day. And nine times out of 10, the, the, the horse, so to speak, right. If you use the horse, the horse that's getting subbed out for that guy actually, is rooting for that guy. Right. You know, right. Like he, he's right. like, go, yeah, he, he understands what's happening and, and um, it ends up working out pretty well. I know we had a few technical difficulties coming in. So I, I, I'm cautious when I ask this question, you take your computer and fan out to your right over your right shoulder. This way. How, how far does it go down that way? Uh, it's well, let's see. We got, we go just down. Oh, nice. Down nice. that way, we got we got a handful of, of good ones out there. Some of them still playing. And then, in fairness, we have another. I have um, we have another twelve since we did the wall. We have another twelve uh, that we have to get up there. So I have to get I have to get like a seamstress or somebody to yeah yeah you gonna have them to and do it. I don't want to use yeah. another wall because it starts becoming kind of silly. I want to try to keep it on one wall. I, it's, yeah, a, it's, I, a, it's an engineering challenge. So we'll yeah. see if I can actually use my degree to some. Well, some there you that. go. I was, I was saying, look, we got an engineer in the building, folks. That's right. Um, uh, along the way, is one of those guys on the wall there the best you've ever coached? No, Eric, you know you know better than that. That's a far too loaded question for any it, coach. It is, but I have to ask it. Um, the, the ones I love are the ones that, look, we recognize those names on the wall, but it's the guy that we don't know that was a great locker room guy or was a great reserve or for whatever reason, he was the best I ever worked with. He wasn't the guy who earned the press. He wasn't the guy who went on to the next level. He wasn't that guy, but he was the guy that kept everyone in check, made things tick over for us, was the golden jock as we referred to it tournament time at Virginia. It's those, the, those are the guys I love to hear about. Do you have one of those stories? Oh, uh, I mean, every good team has got got those guys, right? Every every good team has the. I mean, the the um, you know the the, the Stanford team that gets to the finals got you know, um, the the like the Shan Gauze. I love the the Shan Gauze, the little holding midfielder. Everybody talked about our our um, goalkeeper, uh, who was an All American. Our center back Jamie Clark, who's now the coach at University of Washington. Um, uh, Bobby's son, he was an amazing player. He had uh, uh, not in that same team, but Ryan Nelson, who oh, went yeah, on yeah. to Captain Blackburn. He he's, yeah. he would be up there for one of the best I've ever coached. To be fair, like he would be right, like, right. yeah, we'll make sure he's in the finalist pool for that. Yeah. Um, just as a leader, though, right? <laughs> went to DC United and and was just a leader, and and the guys just looked to him to solve problems, and he was ready right. for that. And mm -hmm. uh, Simon Elliott, who played in the Premier League, also another New Zealander, along with, with Ryan. That, they, 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 those guys were great, but Shanga was like this this little bulldog of a holding mid and did all the hard work, all the grunt work, and allowed those guys to sort of do some of these other things that they that they did. I I, I have this a, a story. I was actually I was telling our team last year about Shang Shanga in uh, nineteen in uh, ninety eight. I think in the semifinals we beat Maryland one nothing, and and um, uh, there was a moment he was he was he was the six right. He was that holding mid guy, and he had a a, a moment where we lost the ball in the other team's box and he he was up there for some reason and the other team was transitioning back against our back four with no help he was he was on a dead sprint right chasing sure. and he was screaming at the back four and all you who's saying i'm coming i'm coming that's what he was telling the back four right <laughs> and just, just hold on to him a little bit i'm coming yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? and that kind of that kind of like 
I'll do the hard work for you. I have a job. I'm going to do it. I'm going to help. I'm going to like that for me. Like those are the guys, every team's got those guys. Every great team has yeah. got those guys that without which, you know, they, they, they don't survive the hard ones. They don't survive those hard moments that test, that test you. Take us into a, a, a training session of yours. Uh, set it up for us, paint a picture in our, in our minds as to what that looks like. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, my, if, if I could just do one session over and over again, it's the, it's the day before a game session for us. Right. So it's uh, we call it a speed of play session. You know, it's, I, I think for a lot of places that might be in vogue, the shorter sessions, mm -hmm. um, but they're the most fun for me because we, we restrict everything to two touch for the most part. Okay. Um, and, and I think, I don't think there's a better teacher of the game of, of soccer uh, than, 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 than the two touch restriction, because it, it teaches you to think fast. It teaches you how to space. Well, it teaches you how to support each other. Well, yeah. uh, and it shows you as a coach, like, well, who's thinking well, right? So if you, if you only have two touches to solve a problem and you're not technical enough to have a good first touch, well, then you're going to be in, 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 in yeah. trouble. If you're not yeah. thinking fast enough to know where you're going before you get the ball, your first touch doesn't know where to go. And so you're, you're in trouble. So yeah. it, it, it teaches a huge amount of habits that no exercise I think can really do. And so, you know, we'll, we'll set up things into maybe two or three versions of that session. Right. So um, there's nothing better you know, if we, and sometimes we can't, cause we come to the field together if we're on the road or, or, you know, maybe we'll have a meeting or another team's training right before us or women are training right before us or whatever it is. But um, whenever we can, you want to have that set up because you, you know, the guys love the session too, right? So there's nothing better for a team. If you're a player walking onto a field and seeing the field sort of set and ready, right? Yep. So if you have, uh, you know, we, we, we have our sort of a quick old cones arranged by rainbow color, right? They used to just be all red all the time. Now they're like red and yellow and blue and green, and, you know, you can in different sizes and, and, the, and, and so you can set up the cones in a way that, shows the team what you're doing in a funny way. If you just have a whole bunch of red cones, you throw them in the field, like you can't. Yeah. You can't your landing strip, what, your, your airport you're, landing strip, yeah. Right, it's just like there's cones, you don't really kind of, you can't see the shape maybe, like it could be a lot of different shapes. But uh, what we'll do, we'll have technical stuff set up. So we'll do one of two or three technical sessions and you'll have like a, a box of reds, box of yellows, a box of you know reds, box of yellows, you alternate them or whatever. So it becomes very clear by color what the yep. shape of what you're doing is um mm -hmm. or we'll do a, a a sort of a snake passing sequence where you'll have like all the all the yellows on it on, on the end of them like you'll have a row of greens or, or blues or something in the middle to sort of delineate where guys are supposed to go to start the exercise right yep. and and the, the, that color scheming actually makes a huge difference for, for for where you are but like setting that up here in the corner then you're moving to um, from a technical bit where you want to be sharp, you want to be quick. You got uh, 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 15 minutes to sort of warm them up after their sort of dynamic warm up into into grids, where we'll take we'll we'll sort of delineate again. You delineate it with the the poles, I guess the the, the poles, yeah. which give you sort of corner flags and sort of cent center lines, and then you can mm -hmm. use the cones for the rest. But the, the it gives you that sense of space for um we do there's a handful of different sort of smaller size possession things we do we do like a 5v2 transfer box 5v3 yep. transfer box um which is really designed to get your center mid sort of involved and going right so so it's it's a uh we try to do things as tight so we'll take a team and we'll see how good we are by the size of the, of the grid right so if our team's really going you can do like a 5v2 transfer box and like a you know 12 by 15 size grid um and and these guys are pretty athletic so they'll move so it's got to be very quick and then and you'll keep that same size of 12 by 15 grid with five guys playing possession against against two with three guys waiting yep and and we allow that group to play one touch the five has one touch to solve all the problems pop, 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 pop. the two the, if the two get it they can give it back over to their three and they the thing moves so so the defenders go yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standard transfer box Mm -hmm. um, and then, and we'll, we'll, we'll sort of get them sort of up and running, right. With the thinking going, and then we'll add a defender. So in that same size, 12 by 15 box, you go from five, v two, one touch to five, v three, two touch. So you add a defender, yeah, you get another touch, right. Yeah. So it's, 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 yeah. it's more crowded, but you know, what we'll tell them is like, you know, take two touches when you can, it's not happen. doesn't happen often. Take two touches when you can, but always be prepared to play one, play one when you can, yeah. or say two when you can be prepared to play one when you have to. 
and 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 that kind of gets the 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 speed of what you want up um and then we'll move over to to the other side of the field where we have we we really like the the four by six permanent quick goals the white framed yep. uh for for and and we'll play either one of two things we'll either play what we call liverpool possession which or a uh, liverpool game which is just 11 uh, 10 v 10 no goalies 10 v 10 in a 40 by 50 field just with a, with a goal and two touch right and it's incredibly tight there's a lot of turnovers in that but you you have these wonderful moments of combination play that that succeed or transition you know to to to, to go the other way or we'll flip it so more or less the same dimension, but instead of being a longer field, 40 by wide by 50, you go the other direction, play across those rough dimensions, and yeah. play a six goal game. So you right. have you have right. six of those, three on one side, three on the other. And and when you have the proper goals, like I mean, we have you, you you've seen like the, the, the bonnets and you have the, the pugs that sort of pop up, and those are good, but when you have like the the, the proper goals, guys like shoot like guys like scoring on that right like yeah, changes the it. feel as a player yeah, yeah it's a goal right you can hit it you can hit these little things and 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 it just it, it gives you a little bit more pop but when you have the six goals um we'll we'll play a lot of times the 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 long one goal we call liverpool game or we'll play the wider six goal game depending on what we think the game the next day needs right so yeah. we think we're gonna have possession we're gonna need to be left and right and switching play a lot we'll do the six goal game Yep. If we think we're going to be dealing with transition, trying to play forward passes a little bit more, how to break down teams, then, then we'll play, you know, so we'll, we'll orient what we're doing with that, depending on what we think the the, eat, the, the sort of the mentality of what the team needs to be for the, yeah. for the game the next day. Perfect. Uh, and well, then typically we'll, we'll go to, you know, we'll go to like a half field or two thirds field length by full field width. We almost never train full field, almost never. And we'll keep it two touch. We put the goalkeepers in, you know, we played two, maybe seven minute halves, two touch, 11 v 11 guys score goals and then done right and and it's the speed of it the tempo of it is usually really good and high and if you get you know 22 good players like it's really fun it's really yeah fun. so Absolutely. the two touch stuff gets the get the thinking right gets the sharing of the ball right gets the spacing right you open up the field you can do all sorts of things but then it's um it's it, it also helps them guys maybe aren't gonna be less liable to kick each other a day before a game yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so perfect. They're dribbler, they're going to be smacked every so often. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Get a piece of that guy. Yeah. If you could rewind the clock and do it all over, is there any one big nugget of advice you'd give yourself? Uh, I actually think the biggest bit of advice I would give myself, Eric, is um, prioritize the people you bring in over the theory of the talent, over anything else, right? Make sure from a... Um, player point of view that you know when i think of the players that 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 it just didn't work for right they never really came through how i hoped they were going to come through or you know they were unhappy and they transferred out or they weren't good locker room guys yeah. or whatever that is working hard to make sure that you're getting the right people in as best as you can because you can't get it perfect right you're vetting of of people and, and personalities yeah. and yeah. and and intrinsic motivation and all those things uh but the, the the more i think back on the successful teams and the teams that maybe were more challenging it it all has it has nothing to do with talent it has nothing to do with talent it all has to do with the right chemistry uh good people guys who are working hard guys who are servant leaders those kinds of personalities yeah. you know the more of those people you get in the happier your days are in in the guys that you've recruited and brought in do, do you feel like you've gotten it wrong very often i i always think i don't right and and i sat down i funny i sat down with with um you know zach samuel who is my assistant he's now the head coach in american and has done you know he just took him to the NCAA tournament won the patriot league in his like second year there so he's he did whatever Bobby did. I, I can't, you know, I'm sort of the, the odd duck on this stuff for the quick, the quick turnarounds. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about all the guys, right. That just didn't, that were just like, Oh man, that was a disaster. This kid just didn't, you know, we had such a hard time with that. And, and um, you know, it, it's more than I, than I want to say, right. There's more than I would like, I was like, yeah, yeah. I remember him. I remember him. He kind of laughed about this guy and he, this guy had to transfer out or this guy, you know, quit the team or and you kind of go through it and it's like, you know, there's, it's a decent number more than you kind of want, want it to be. Um, but, um, you know, if you have a group, if you, if you've been doing it for what, 25 years, 
you're going to have all sorts of, of, yeah. of, it's just too many people, right? Too many personalities, too many situations, too many things where you're not going to get it right all the time or the situation is going to not suit everybody all the time too. Right. So, yeah. um, and, and none of these are bad kids. You know, none of them are just bad people, bad kids. It's, it's a lot of the times it's just kids growing up. You know, I actually had a, a situation with a player that we had to kick off the team because he, he was such a mess up. Right. It was just like, Oh man, over and over the same kid, this, and then he, he finally did something where it's like, we can't, you know, it's not going to work. Listen, right, right. Go around. Right. Um, we had to remove him from the team. Um, and two things happened. One is it was, um, right before one of the most successful runs we've ever had. And so like my assistants will always be like, Oh, the, the reason that team won <laughs> is we got rid of that one. Right. Yeah. 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 And there's some truth to that, right. Probably a little bit of truth to that. But the other thing that was really interesting that happened was that player came back into the office, um, you know, maybe eight or eight or eight or so years later. Right. Was like, hey, you know, coach Weiss, I just want to tell you like, th- you know, I was such a pain in the butt. I'm so, he, he was apologizing. He just was yeah. up at that time. Yeah. And he, that and he was like, the best thing that happened to him was us removing him from the team because he had yeah. to really sort of take stock as to like what happened and what, what it meant for him. And, and he says it was the best thing that ever happened to him. He just wasn't ready for the environment we were trying to put into place. You know, if you give, if we gave him four dip, four more years, he comes in as a 21 year old or 20, he would have been a great, he would have been great. He yeah. just, he wasn't in a place where he could sort of do it at sure. that time. Sure. You know, every, every one of these situations is, is, is really, really different, but I think it's, you know, the ability to surround yourself with, and, and, and as a coach, listen, you know, I'll, I'll say this all the time, your assistance, that pool of assistance you have to get that right. And, and that's all about good people, high character people. Um, and in my situation, it's, it's people that I want to have around and I want to, I can have fun with. Right. Right. I want to have fun with my, with my coworkers and, and I only have fun when there's, they're quality people, uh, yeah. but, yeah. but there's plenty of guys who are really quality coaches and hard workers that have come in and been maybe on my staff and, and they just weren't that fun. Right. I don't think they enjoyed themselves in yeah. the office as much as, as I did. And, 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 it, and so it didn't, it just didn't work out that well, but putting yourself in that environment where you're just around people you want to be around, yeah. right. That that's gotta be your first order. But like, if you can figure out who those people are, um, you're going to have a, you're going to have a long and happy and, and uh, successful career. And, and that's maybe true for any, for any industry, to be fair. Perfect. Well, listen, uh, I'll, I'll be honest here. This has been a ton of fun. Very much appreciated. Um, I have to ask just because I got to throw it out there. If I call you or text you and say, hey, I'm pulling into D.C. right now. Uh, can I drop by and watch some training? Training training is open for anybody, even you, Eric, even you. You're always welcome. <laughs> right. Training is open. I never I never close training. I never close training. I always like people to come and, awesome. and watch and, and try to figure out what the heck we're doing. Maybe awesome. they can tell me. <laughs> well, listen, thank you. I know uh, preseason's right around the corner. All the best. We'll be watching. Have a great run. And uh, we'll, I'll see you on the recruiting trail. I'll see you in D.C. or yeah, somewhere along the way, I'm sure. All right, Eric. Always great to see you.